Okay, and now we're talking about a heat exchanger. There's a difference between the more common uh, plate and frame or flat plate heat exchanger, which you guys have probably been exposed to at this point, and the kind of heat exchanger that you're going to get in a geothermal heat pump. The kind of geothermal heat, the kind of heat exchanger, at least on the source side or earth side, that is exchanging on that loop fluid or on that well water is what's called a coaxial or serpentine heat exchanger. And here I have a cutaway of one. Pass that around. And what this is, is a big spool of pipe with a fluted pipe inside it. The earth water or closed loop fluid moves through that central fluted pipe. And on the outer pi in between that fluted pipe and the outer pipe is my refrigerant. So here comes 50 degree water, let's say, into that pipe, and on the other side of that pipe I have minus 30 degrees refrigerant. Right? So very easy for ten, five, six or eight, ten units of energy to move from one to the other, hot, cold to cold. And then I expand into that gas and it turn, turn, change the state of the refrigerant into a gas, release that heat, come back down, condense, and do it all over again. So the reason I show you that is because when we talk about the source side, you're like, well, why, why would you use this thing? In fact, it takes up more real estate in the cabinet than its flat plate counterpart. Okay, and we know what a flat plate is, a whole bunch of plates squished together, and I got my earth fluid on one side and my building fluid on the other side, and they all kind of weave in and through the left-hand side of the plates, and this side weaves through all the right-hand side of the plates, and between that plate wall I make a heat exchange. Well, those are much more compact and have much more surface area for a heat exchange to occur but by their physical nature, they're basically saying, hey, clog me up. Because very small orifice is going in between those plates, right, for that fluid to go through. So if I have mineral-rich fluid, I'm going to clog up a, a plate and frame pretty quick. Not only that, if I find that because regardless of why, I end up with a poorly set up uh, psychometric uh, profile, I could freeze that fluid coming in from the earth. Freeze a flat plate, you got a ruptured flat plate. Lightly freeze a coax, not a big deal, it's going to flex. That fluted pipe is going to flex as we change the temperature of that metal. So not only does it allow for the particulates to come right back, right through and right back out to the well on a recirculation, but it also is something that can be lightly froze. In fact, when we see somebody has aerated a water system and we've got scale inside the heat exchanger, what they will do typically is lightly freeze it and then circulate it to slough off that scale. So the flexible nature and the open orifice nature of this type of heat exchanger, although it takes up more space in the cabinet, is really a you got to do it this way as far as geo, at least on the source side. You will find, find flat plates on the, on the building side, on the load side, because that's a pristine loop, right? I don't mean, need to worry as much about particulates, minerality, in that side of the equation, okay? So know that, that's important to know. Again, delta T. In the winter, I'm extracting stored heat, solar gain. It's really, the geothermal heat pump's really nothing more than a solar energy management. So I'm extracting heat from the earth in the winter and I'm dispelling unwanted gain to the earth in the summer. Further I travel between point A and point B, more energy I use. It's that simple. So the most efficient, effective geosystem is one that A, minimizes the number of secondary or parasitic energy using pumps. Well, Mr. Jones has got 20 zones and they're all little 007 circulators, but you know, they only use 40 bucks a year, yeah, 40 times 20, that's 800 bucks worth of circulation. When we look at the super efficient systems of tomorrow, today, I should say, it's not just about the box. Look at everything. What I'm here to explain and hopefully leave you guys with is that choosing box A or B is probably the smallest issue on a good geo system. It's what I do on either side of the box to manage deltas of temperature and pressure to their most advantageous point that will make it a successful system. Not just for efficiency, but also for longevity. You know, think of uh, 
you and your clone are going to run a race. You, you take your clone's nose shut, tape a straw in his mouth. You go and you run that 5K. You probably finish the race relatively close to one another. But your clone is going to be a lot more hot and bothered because they couldn't vent as easily, couldn't breathe as easily. Same with high pressure duct work. If I've got an air conditioning system and the duct work is undersized, what happens to that coil? It freezes up. Got to let turn it off and let it melt off before I can run the system again, right? Well, now I got a geothermal heat pump. I'm going to run that refrigerant circuit in the other direction in the winter time. If I have an undersized air stream for heating with a hot coil, I cook my heat pump. You want a three-year geothermal system or a 30-year geothermal system? People don't understand the importance of duct static. We want a nice low duct static, easy breathing, because I've got a refrigerant-based delivery. Not like hot water, it's just going to dissipate the tank temperature slower. I'm going to cook my refrigerant circuit. I'm going to take myself out of that sweet spot of the psychometric activity, right? Either on the source or on the load side. Very important with the geo design. With a device that's 500% efficient, when I make mistakes and depart from those laboratory settings by which that unit was identified as efficiency, you can multiply those mistakes times five. And I can end up with a COP of two and a half pretty quick out of a five COP device if I don't manage those what I'll call near laboratory settings by which the unit got its rating. So minimize the deltas of pressure, except in a closed loop, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Low duct static, proper pipe sizing, low turbulence, minimize loss on the way to the zone. Well, you know, geo is a lot more expensive than traditional systems. Last thing I want to do is put it in the system and get all those beautiful BTUs and dump half of them into the basement or the attic because my delivery mechanisms are shedding this wonderful energy that I just paid to deliver to the space I want to heat or cool. And we all know all about the new IECC code where you're going to have 13% or less duct loss. Get, you know, I can't tell you how many times I go into an attic where they got R30 in between the joists and they got R4 on the duct wrap on top of it. Not great. But, you know, it's common because people would retrofit air conditioning systems and they never said, I want the most efficient system. They said, I want the cheapest system, right? Well, that's a 100-foot run of flex duct hanging on top of the joist in the attic. And I've seen it more often than I care to mention. Deploy 100% GM. Okay, not to say you can't do dual fuel, and we'll talk a little bit about those numbers in a bit. But 100% of GO is going to give me 365 days of wow numbers. Less than that, then whatever that other mechanism is that's making up the difference is going to be quantified into my annual energy cost and my investment in infrastructure and mechanics. You know, if I look at a typical traditional system, I've got either fossil-based heating or electric, and then I've got a separate air conditioner. I've got two whole systems to manage in the typical traditional setup. With geothermal, I've got one device does it all. Common ductwork sized for the dominant load, forward and reverse, I'm done. Same kind of maintenance as a refrigerator, as long as I keep the cat hair vacuumed off the coil, right? Careful design is critical to maintaining those ratings, those laboratory ratings, and they are achievable. Quality design and install, that is the key. If I leave you with nothing else today, yeah, I heard about geothermal, you really got to do the math on both sides of the box. Uh, and a quick word on other renewables. So, so people say, well, oh, you know, the guy's going to do geo. I don't know why everybody's talking about geo. They should be doing solar. No, the answer is you should be doing both. Think about it. If I make an investment in, let's say, PV or wind, and I'm making kilowatts, what better thing to apply the kilowatt that I made using PV or wind than to a geothermal heat pump? In fact, if I look at a payback on a solar system, and I have a house that I've also got the geothermal system in, I'm, I can multiply my payback times five. I can pay back that PV in a fifth of the time because I'm using the kilowatt I make toward a five times result. This table we took out of Scientific American back in 03, and I can, I'm happy to report that these numbers have come down significantly since. But what they represent is the amount of money I got to pay to develop a kilowatt of output. 
with those renewables, those electric makers, okay? Well, let's say I, and now I'm going to apply that, that kilowatt to a 3.8 COP heat pump. That's a falling out of bed efficiency. If you didn't get at least a 3.8, you didn't pay attention, okay? So that's pretty, pretty conservative. So apply that 3.8 to the PV that I'm paying between 47 and 70 cents a kilowatt to develop. Now I'm paying less than 13 to 18 cents by applying the multiplied effect of that kilowatt. So the answer is not do this or that, it's yes, do both. Now if I don't pay attention, and you're not going to get those numbers. That's the key. So three big ugly costs in geothermal heat pumps land. Well, this cost and this cost exist in any kind of heat pump cooling. In fact, this cost is often two devices, right? Like we said, separate air conditioning and heating. Distribution is whatever. Is it radiant floor? Is it base points? Is it air streams? Is it fan coils? Is it chilled beams? Whatever, okay? Earth coupling is the, the additional cost, and by definition, I'm going to have an earth coupling if I've got a geothermal system. So that's the additional cost. As a rule, if I look at the, your, your near mortal system, the cost of these elements are a third, a third, and a third. So I've added a third to get more than twice the efficiency of the best traditional systems available. Yes? Is the earth coupling, I, I assume the well, and the the well or the loop field. Yep. So the, uh, I mean, that could also be theoretically part of the water source, domestic water. Well, you know, there are a couple systems that we have heard of that have used domestic water. One guy down in New York that worked for the water district, you know, and they're on a municipality. Yeah. Problem with a municipal water source is that the offset lines through the neighborhood are between four and six feet down. I was thinking more like a drill well. A, a larger drill well than for the domestic water. Right? Absolutely. In fact, the one that my dad is internationally recognized for, the Standing Column Well, we've got about 15,000 systems from Maine to Manhattan. About 13,000 of those are Standing Column Wells, and about 80% of those 13,000 are the domestic well for the house and the geo exchange. And in fact, every time I flush a john, fill a pasta pot, take a shower, I bleed off temperature affected water, which makes non temperature affected water take its place from far afield, thereby either warming up that conductive exchange medium in the winter or cooling it off in the summer. So we'll talk more about that earth coupling in a minute, but absolutely is the answer. Okay? So now, as this is the big additional and different item that is exclusive to this technology, we'll talk about earth coupling. So here's a very rudimentary drawing of the three methods that are currently recognized by the geothermal industry, the international ground source heat pump industry. The least expensive and most efficient is the open system one-way street. And down in Long Island and in, where they deserve it the least, out there in the Hamptons, the little 20,000 square foot cottages, guys that your dad might work for. <laughs> They have got what's called terminal moraine. Okay, most people believe that at the end of the ice age, a glacier was coming down from the north and stopped at about Plymouth Mass, and basically pushed up about 1,500 feet of sand and clay and cobbles in its wake. And that's represented along the coast down from Plymouth, all of Long Island, Brooklyn, the Bronx, this side of the river. So I can go sandpoint well, you know, 200 feet down, get 300 gallons a minute. Largely tidal flow, brackish, no big deal. And but more importantly, I can drill another well, and I can percolate that kind of regular flow right back into that kind of formation. Not much, not so in bedrock. Not going to give me big yields. Not going to allow me to percolate back. So geology is going to dictate. And the re the reality of this method in New England is it's not common because of geological formations that prohibit it. All three methods, worth noting, three gallons per minute per ton across the heat exchanger. So if I've got a five ton system, I want to move 15 gallons a minute across that heat exchanger at a nice low pressure, 22 to 28 pounds, to run that system. 
So if I've got an open well on a five-ton house, I need 15 gallons a minute all day, every day, hallelujah, forever, out of that source. And probably another five for my domestic use, right? So good work if you can get it. But you need to have those geological conditions in order to take advantage of that. And obviously the reason that that's so wonderful is it's 50 degrees one-way street. I can suck heat out of it in the winter, I can dump heat into it in the summer, and I don't have to go back to a finite conductive space to recharge that temperature, okay? So advective, 100% advective, the energy is moving with the fluid that was exposed inside the earth. And water is not really what's hot, it's the earth that's hot, the water's exposed to it. So the water becomes the medium for moving that that temperature delta across your heat exchanger. On the other end of the scale, and the one that's most proliferated in the United States, and really internationally, is the closed loop method. Here I'm burying high density polyethylene, black plastic pipe, either in a trench, straight out and straight back, or a flattened out slinky, or in loops in a pond, or in the, the method that we would typically recommend here in New England, in a vertical borehole down and back up again in a sort of an upside down hairpin. That is 100% conductive, meaning nothing underground moves. The heat energy is moving in and out of the loop through that plastic pipe wall. And I recirculate that pristine loop across the heat exchanger to make my heat exchange. Thermally speaking, this method is 20% less efficient and capacity than the open system counterparts. Because although that pipe is really good stuff, really hardy, guaranteed for 50 years, all melted together, there's no moving parts underground because I don't want them to expand and contract and leak. We used to do that, don't do that anymore. Great stuff, but not very thermally transparent. Pretty good insulator. So I actually have to depress that fluid in that loop in the winter, and I have to increase the fluid in that loop in the summer so that I can have an effective heat exchange through that pipe wall. If I come in at, say, 50, and then here in the middle, just to jump ahead, is really a hybrid of the two. Here I got a bedrock well, which is very common in New England. I take the water out of the bottom, go across my heat exchanger, and then return 100% of it back to the top. So the length of that wet borehole becomes my heat exchanger, my conductive space, by which I'm making a connection to the earth. Well, like this method, there is no intermediary between the earth and the fluid going across the heat exchanger, like there is with a conductive loop. Doesn't make this bad and the other good. It is what it is. And now let's say I'm going to come in and say, well, that's okay. Well, why don't you just come in at 50 anyway? Let's say I come in at 50, I go back at 45. And so that's my delta right there, okay? Great. So by the time it travels back down again, hopefully this bore will be long enough. Got enough mass in it touching the earth that by the time I get down to the bottom and I'm on my way in again, it's 50 degrees. It does that over and over and over again, right? On a closed loop, if I came in at 50 and I went back at say 45, 44, then that's only six degree delta between the say 50 degree earth on the outside of that pipe wall, which might, let's say it's now 49 because I've been shedding out. Not enough of a difference in temperature for an effective heat exchange to occur through a reasonable amount of plastic pipe asset underground. Well, you could say, yeah, no, if you had, you know, you've got a mile of pipe for your five tons, but what if you had five miles of pipe? You could do better deltas. Sure, but remember what I said earlier, the one place in geothermal design where, where pressure is considered an important design feature is in the closed loop? Here's the explanation. There are really sort of three basic design parameters of that closed loop, okay? I'm gonna buy so much pipe, I'm gonna put an antifreeze and water solution in the pipe, I'm gonna to have to bury that pipe, and I'm gonna to have to pump that fluid. Now, when we talk about conductive heat exchange in a closed loop, think about the fluid moving through that pipe, it's being pumped, right? If I have a nice, smooth, easy, low pressure, I'm gonna get laminar flow, right? meaning all the fluid's just kind of going like this, right through the middle of the pipe. Which means that the fluid that is in the middle of that pipe is not going to be making a heat exchange, right? Because it's not touching the outer wall of the pipe by which it will make its connection to the earth. 
So a properly designed closed loop, and we do a lot of them, we love them too, we actually design for turbulence. I need to turbulate all the fluid in that loop so that all the fluid is making a heat exchange by coming into contact with the outer wall of that pipe. Then I gotta look at pumping energy. As I create turbulence, I increase my pumping penalty, right? And as I look at how much asset I have to put underground, I look at it, my, my initial investment. So a closed loop designer will look at all three of those things. How much pumping penalty am I gonna be faced with? How much asset do I have to buy? And where do I have to go in my design to get that turbulation and a good heat exchange? So the same laboratory setting by which those units are rated also identifies sort of the sweet spot of closed loop design. You know, in the, in the laboratory we use just the amount pump, enough pumping energy so we can get it to turbulate and just amount, enough closed loop ass, a, asset and okay, now how's my, how's my rating? So that there's nobody doing any missed opportunity on the parasitic activity on either the source side or the load side in that rating. Yes, go ahead. Would it ever make sense, like say you had a, a standing column well that put out 10 gallons a minute and you wanted to get a five tons, you needed five tons, you wanted five tons. Obviously you're not going to get it out of a 10 gallon well. Right. So does it ever, would it make sense to like hybrid, do some closed loop and some? This is what we do. Great question and you're right on time. So we look at the realities of a properly sized closed loop. I want to say one more time thing before we leave here. If I go to ASHRAE 13256, okay, our ISO 13256 standards, which is where um, AHRI directory, that's the standards they use for their rating because those are the sweet spot of design. Proper closed loop design will identify incoming fluid temperature down to about 32 degrees in the winter and no higher than 77 degrees in the summer. So if I come in on the coldest winter day at 32 degrees and I go back at let's say 26 or so, that's going to give me my six or eight degrees of exchange delta for my heat exchanger and my delivery. But then I'm okay, if I come back at 26 and it's 49 on the other side of that pipe wall, okay, well that's a fairly good delta. That's enough of a delta for me to get a good effective heat exchange. So that is sort of the sweet spot. So when you look at the ground loop heat pump efficiencies in the table, the closed loop efficiencies, that's the numbers they used. 32 and 77. 32 is the coldest coming in, 77 is the hottest coming in, in cooling. But you'll go to the manufacturer and they all give away software, geo designer, geo analyst. You, you don't need to buy anything and boy, look, you just plug in the numbers and this spits out a nice little bar graph from Mrs. Jones and go, here we go. And they'll say, well, let's use 30 and 95 instead of 32 and 77. And I'll say, well, wait a minute, oh, excuse me, hello. Um, if I don't use 32 and 77, then I depart from the test temperatures that they used when they rated the unit, and I will not achieve those efficiencies. Yeah, yeah, but look at how much cheaper it makes the loops. That's what's going on in the industry, and don't count on the manufacturer to help you with it, because they are purposely trying to win the sale. The unit's still going to run, but I'm going to run outside of that sweet spot by which the rating was identified, and so I ain't going to get the rating in operation. That's very important, not only with the loop, but also with the open system. Undersizing the asset you need for the earth exchange will absolutely lead to missed opportunity and efficiency. And if you sold this thing based on a COP of four and a half or five, and you did a payback analysis based on the cost of fuels, and then you're operating at a COP of three, somebody is gonna give you a call, and they're not gonna be happy. So be aware of that. Okay. It's not to say, and you can say, okay, well, we're going to put in a heat pack, and Mrs. Jones understands, and she doesn't want five tons, she wants four tons, she knows she needs five, but she doesn't want to pay another 20% today, and she knows she's going to spin the meter off the wall come February with an electric resistance heater. Fine. Make sure that you and your customer are sensitized to the realities that are going to occur 
after we drive off. Okay. So now the closed uh, closed loop could be any number of things. Remember we talked about the amount of asset and the amount of friction and the amount of pumping. The horizontal loop, four to six feet down, two feet apart, out and back. I'm looking at about 700 feet of pipe per ton of equipment. Pond loop, about the same amount, but my problem here is, okay, when I get really cold in the winter, it's 50 degrees on the outside of this pipe wall. When the pond freezes over, it's going to be 39 and a half degrees on the outside of this pipe wall. So again, less effective exchange deltas. It doesn't make it bad. It is what it is. Okay. The vertical, and then the slinky loop is another form of a horizontal loop you're looking at between 900 and 1100 feet of pipe per ton. So not only is your pipe investment higher, but so is your antifreeze investment, your deployment investment may or may not be higher based on the structure, but your friction is going to be much more significant, and so is your pumping penalty. Because I got more asset to turbulate. Yes? Why is antifreeze required? Because I'm going to, again, come in properly designed, which is rare, frankly, at as low as freezing, and go back significantly lower than freezing, so that I can make an effective heat exchange in that plastic pipe wall through the wall into the earth. So by definition, I can't freeze that fluid. I got to put antifreeze in it, and it's benign antifreeze. We'll talk about that. Oh, yeah. later. So the vertical does a couple of really good things. It's definitely the most expensive because I got to drill the hole, and if I'm drilling in bedrock, that's an expensive drilling. Okay, like it is here in New York. And then I go down and back up again in sort of an upside down hairpin, and then I'm going to backfill. They're three quarters of an inch to one and a quarter inch in diameter, and I got a six inch bore. So then I got to backfill the void around those pipes in that bore hole with a highly conductive stone dust called bentonite grout, made by little cottage industries like Halliburton. Okay. <laughs> that makes the intimate connection between the pipe wall and the earth. But the other thing that's great about it is it protects the asset. You know, I can tell you, I have seen beaver dams made out of high density polyethylene. Murphy is alive and well on geo jobs too. Okay. So they're all fine, and if they're all done properly, they will all deliver that same 32 and 77. Okay? If I undersize them, they won't. At one point, you will lock out if you get too cold or too hot. Okay? But suffice to say, even if you underdesign them, they will typically still operate. I cut jumpers on the unit that say, hey, even if the fluid comes in at 20, keep running. 